Super bosses are notorious amongst video game communities. They often push players to the absolute limits of their knowledge and skill, and they expect players to have mastery of a game's respective systems to come out on top. Some of these super bosses are just tough as nails due to how buffed their stats are in respect to the player, or because they simply have horrible abilities that just feel unfair in relation to the game's mechanics. But there's also another type of super boss, those that adapt. Quite often, super bosses have specific attack patterns that can be memorized and exploited. But there's also a select group of super bosses that penalize players for attempting to utilize certain strategies to bring about victory. It's those super bosses that we're going to be running through today, and we're going to kick things off with one of the most notorious, Yzmat from Final Fantasy XII. By the time Final Fantasy XII released, super bosses had become codified part of the overarching gameplay experience. And as if to emphasize this and make everything much more structured, some of the hardest enemies that appeared in Final Fantasy XII were associated with the hunt system. What started off with the player squaring off against the rogue Tomato ended up with them facing off against the most powerful dragon ever created in that universe, Yzmat. The hunt itself was posted by Mont Blanc, after learning that Yzmat had been driven to madness and destroyed its creator, the often cheerful Moogle vowed revenge, as with the creator destroyed, life had a lot less joy. Yzmat was encounterable at the Colosseum in the Ridderana Cataract, and it has since become infamous due to the sheer amount of HP the superboss had, over 50 million. This meant the fight often turned into a war of attrition, with a player seeking to grind the dragon down, especially in the original version of the game as regular attacks were unable to break the damage limit. Yzmat could also deal significant damage when close up, and this led to some players attempting to create some distance. This seemed like a sensible strategy, as through ranged attacks Yzmat could still be hurt with theoretically no reprisal. But what players didn't anticipate was the super boss adjusting its own strategy to compensate. Should the player go too far away from Yzmat, due to the now reduced perceived threat, the super boss prioritized recovery through the use of defensive and offensive self buffs. Its offensive arsenal was also adjusted though, as Yzmat punished players by using more instant death attacks. This meant that to achieve victory, it was often best to avoid trying to create that distance, lest players invoke even more wrath from this notorious superboss. Another superboss that implemented a similar adaptive strategy was Aeronite, which appeared in Lightning Returns Final Fantasy XIII. Found wandering around the dead dunes after Day 7, Aeronite stood out as one of the toughest encounters in the game and this was in part due to its own strategy being proximity based. But whereas Yzmat took the time to heal and self buff should the player attempt to create some distance, Aeronite took a far more aggressive stance. To punish players who strayed too far from the encounter and outside of its typical hitbox, Aeronite used its black hole ability. This then sucked lightning straight back into the fray and stopped any attempt at escape or indeed any attempt at trying to evade Aeronite's attacks. By implementing this strategy, players had to think about how they wanted to tackle the Aeronite encounter, and it meant all out assault wasn't a bad option. However, they would also have to contend with Aeronite's other adaptations as the fight progressed. These weren't so much in response to anything specific the player did outside of staggering it, but these phases did make the encounter much more challenging as it progressed, requiring the player to stay focused and not let up with their assault. Now, even before Final Fantasy V introduced the first official super bosses in Omega and Shinryu, there had been a few pseudo super bosses featured across the franchise, and one of them, the Iron Giant, appeared in the Famicom version of Final Fantasy II. Similar to Warmech, which had appeared in the original Final Fantasy, the Iron Giant appeared towards the game's conclusion, encounterable on floors 5F to 7F of the game's final dungeon, Pandemonium. But as if to punish players who were grinding too much, the developers implemented the Iron Giant as an uncomfortable surprise, as it only appeared as the 64th battle within that particular area. The Iron Giant featured the joint highest base attack and the joint second highest base defense. It also had the strongest magic resistance and could deliver 12 physical attacks per turn, a figure that was higher than even the game's final boss. 
The fight could therefore be rather challenging, but perhaps the biggest challenge was ensuring the Iron Giant actually stuck around. Despite its incredible stats, the Iron Giant could flee from the battle. This meant the party could be on the receiving end of some severe punishment, unable to even get revenge or spoil should the Iron Giant retreat from battle. This was where the adaptive strategy came into play however. The natural strategy adopted by the player was to go super defensive, keeping HP up and trying to mitigate damage, but this actually increased the chances of the Iron Giant retreating. The player therefore had to do the opposite. In order to keep the Iron Giant around and increase the chances of receiving the strong rewards for victory, players had to act like a wounded animal. If their collective HP was low, the Iron Giant felt more confident of success and therefore was less likely to run away itself. Final Fantasy IX featured a few different super bosses, but none strike fear into the hearts of players quite like Ozma. Appearing as a giant floating sphere, Ozma's colour palette was abstract as it was no consistency and its upper half was light while its lower half was dark. But before even being able to lay eyes on such a sight, players had to jump through quite a few hoops including playing chocobo hot and cold and hunting down chocographs. Due to the way Final Fantasy IX worked, everything was very self-contained. So whereas many super bosses around this period had HP in the hundreds of thousands and even millions, Ozma's HP was only 55,535. Part of the challenge around Ozma, outside of its abilities, was that it worked outside of the established rules. Ever since the beginning, it had been ingrained that players and enemies could only act when it was their turn. The only slight exception to this was Final Fantasy VII, where the ATB bar filled almost immediately when a limit break was made available. But here, any action performed against Ozma led to it having an instant turn. This made it very difficult for the player to have more than one turn in a row before Ozma performed a move of its own. To try and gain an advantage, players therefore tried to prepare beforehand. This meant they may be encouraged to go into the fight with equipment that enabled them to absorb or nullify certain elemental attacks or status effects. But this was where the true harshness of Ozma shone through, as if the player did this, then it would adapt its attack patterns. Ozma would no longer use abilities that it knew would be ineffective, and it would therefore use its more powerful spells on a more regular basis to compensate. So, if the player preemptively defended against them, it actually made the encounter more difficult. Ozma could however be hindered by the friendly monster side quest, but even with these advantages, the encounter was still incredibly difficult. Now as older hardware ceased to become readily available and more revenue opportunities opened up, Square and subsequently Square Enix sought to port older Final Fantasy games to newer consoles. But to ensure these ports also appealed to older fans, the developers started to think about how they could tease older players back. In the basic sense, this was achieved by enhancing aspects of presentation and making tweaks and modifications to existing gameplay mechanics and the story but it was also achieved through the creation of new content, such as items and equipment, and new challenges, which often came in the form of new dungeons, and of course, super bosses. Final Fantasy IV Advance featured two new super bosses in Zerimus EG and Brachia Rhydos, and it's the latter that will be the focus of this video. Found near the bottom of the Lunar Ruins, Brachia Rhydos ended up being quite a devilish super boss. Whereas many other super bosses attempted to overwhelm the party with massive HP pools or horrible abilities, what made the Brachia Riders fight tough, on paper at least, was its adaptive phases. After starting out in its main phase, Brachia Riders performed a set of abilities that skewed towards physical damage before then starting a countdown to Mega Flare. Should the party then attack Brachia Riders during the countdown, its phase shifted to a more magical stance. And if the Mega Flare countdown was initiated in this phase, further attacks resulted in Brachio Rhydos countering with a powerful Object 199 ability. If the party opted to have Brachio Rhydos stay outside of its magical phase and its HP then fell below 100,000, the final phase then came to the fore, and this placed more emphasis on frustrating and feebling magic including Slow, Toad, Confuse, and Berserk. There was, however, a weakness. Should the party have acquired Kane's Able Lance prior to the encounter, then it would randomly cast Tornado, which bypassed resistances and crumbled Brachia Rhydos. The original version of World of Final Fantasy only featured one super boss, called XG. 
However, a few years after the release of the original game, the developers sought to bring the game to new audiences. This led to the Maxima expansion and it added a boatload of content including Nightmare difficulty, a new secret ending and of course a handful of super bosses. And one of them was a powerful ally from the main scenario, Anna Crow, who was assisted by Tama and Seraphi. Each of the combatants had specific nuances that made the encounter challenging as for example Tama was able to use the powerful Time Walk ability to prolong the fight. Should either Enna, Seraphi or Tama be defeated, Time Walk brought them back to life with full health immediately and this happened the first 8 times any of them were given a KO status. We're going to focus on Seraphi though, as even though Time Walk was frustrating and there was a small degree of adaptation as it was used on whoever the party focused on defeating, Seraphi's ability was much more pointed. By using the Rumor Radar ability, Seraphi was able to communicate with Enna Crow about the party's current elemental weaknesses based on their explicit current party stack. And with this information, Enna was then able to go for the jugular using the appropriate elemental spell that could exploit the party's weakness. That then brings us on to our last entry, Ruby Weapon from Final Fantasy VII. As one of the earlier super bosses, having not even appeared in the Japanese version of the original game, Ruby Weapon was somewhat rigid in terms of how it operated. Found in the desert around the Gold Saucer only after Ultimate Weapon had been defeated, Ruby challenged the player by introducing pseudo companions and these allowed the super boss to be somewhat adaptive as the tentacles influenced its attack patterns. Neither tentacle appeared at the start of the fight but when they were active the player was prevented from escaping. This then introduced elements of jeopardy for the player. When the tentacles were active Ruby wouldn't use physical attacks of its own nor would it use Comet 2 or Whirl Sand but the tentacles themselves could deal fractional physical damage or drain MP and they could inflict numerous status effects. They also gave the player more things to worry about and should the fight go south there was no method of escape if the tentacles were active. As if to emphasize its adaptive nature though, Ruby Weapon's battle script contained numerous if statements that determined its actions. Even the randomness was somewhat predetermined based on the player's actions and nothing was sequential. There was also even specific encounters in place that punished players for things like using Knights of the Round either as a standalone summon or in conjunction with W summon. Taking such a move would see the player receive Ultima for their troubles. But with that, they were 7 super bosses that punished your pitiful attempts at strategy. How many of you fell foul of their adaptations before getting swift retribution of your own? Be sure to let us know in the comments below and of course if you enjoyed this video please be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. Alright everyone with that this is Daryl signing out. As always I'd like to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters especially Benjamin Snow, The Livestream, Juan Jaramillo, Justin Dent and Sukun TDK who are super special Onion Eye supporters and of course a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.